In this lesson, what we're going to do is finish talking about Henry the Seventh by focusing specifically on uh, society and societal problems that existed during the reign of Henry. We're going to focus namely on the different aspects of society, i.e. the different structures of society, making reference to things like the nobility, the gentry, um, the, the commoners, peasants, and all these kind of uh, eras of um, society where we have effectively the um, slower decline of uh, the feudal state and, and feudalism more generally. This is uh, a period of history where we start to see the, the, the slow decline and ultimate collapse of feudalism into um, different types of um, societal structures. So it's important that we uh, understand the aspects as it relates to the structure of society. And we'll look at the different ways in which the class system existed within um, English society. And then we'll move on and talk about a number of different regional divisions and the concept of social discontent, specifically focusing on two major rebellions, the Yorkshire Rebellion and the Cornish Rebellion. So Tudor society was fundamentally hierarchical and based on a system of class. It was a quite a strict system of class and social classes were dominating English society at this time. And when we mean the idea that it is um, strictly installed, the idea that the class structure was strictly adhered to, uh, what we mean by this is there wasn't as much, or really if anything, um, there was very little um, social mobility during this time, the ability for people to move about within the social class system. If you were born into a noble class, you are more likely to stay in the noble class. If you're born in the, a commoners class or, or, or the peasantry, you are more likely to stay in that part of um, society for the, your entire life. And there were just a few different kinds of social classes. There weren't, it wasn't a very complicated hierarchy. Um, the top of this um, social uh, hierarchy was ultimately the king, and just below the king was the nobility. Next, we have the gentry, and then we go down, um, and as we get below the gentry, the, the, the ways in which social classes um, were based on hierarchy got a little bit more mixed up. So we have people like church and churchmen, and we also have commoners and peasants. Um, commoners and peasants towards the bottom society tend to mix quite a lot in terms of um, some being, so, so for example, some co peasants and commoners um, being actually relatively similar on the kind of um, social ladder um, compared to each other. Um, um, but in terms of the delineation, this is how it ultimately uh, existed. And beginning with the nobility, beginning with the top of society, uh, this was the most privileged class in England. And it was also the most powerful. And uh, for this reason, it was obviously a very small class system with a great amount of distrust between the nobility and Henry. We know this already. We know that Henry distrusted the nobility quite significantly because the nobility were the only class that had the power and the and the wealth and the uh, and the money effectively um, necessary or, or available to be able to overthrow him or challenge his dynasty so he wants to make sure that uh, a he was the first and the highest uh, authority in England by being the most powerful this is one of the reasons why he collected his uh, revenues in the way that he did and B, he wants to make sure the nobility were as weak as he could possibly make them, which is a number of reasons why we see things like acts of attainders and bonds and recognizances um, being issued to uh, members of the nobility. Around the year 1500, so about halfway through or slightly more than halfway through the reign of Henry VII, there were around only 55 noble families. So you can see how privileged this um, social class was. The wealth and power of the nobility was ultimately drawn from the fact that they owned so much land. They had a vast amount of land ownership and they could therefore charge, um, uh, charge rent uh, and other things like this on that land. The nobility relied upon by the king um, to enforce law and order within English society as well. So the king uh, would ultimately use the nobility and use a number of trusted members of the nobility to enforce law and order within the realm and find uh, and this uh, this would be um, in the more regional aspects of uh, of the realm. And that's what the nobility was ultimately used for uh, for Henry. <laughs> 
Next on the social list, we have the gentry. Now, this was also a very, very wealthy class in English society. Let's not get this twisted. It's not something that it's not like the gentry represented a significant step down um, in terms of social class. They were also incredibly wealthy, um, and they were made up of people like knights, esquires, and gentlemen. And just like with the nobility, they were very, very few in number, but significantly more than uh, the noble families. So the gentry made up uh, were made up by around five hundred knights, around eight hundred squires, and about five thousand gentlemen. And so among along with the nobility, the gentry and the nobility together made up just one percent of the English population, but represented a very significant percentage of um, the social um, wealth and power within English society. So you can obviously see that we don't have um, any kind of, um, uh, you know, equal distribution of wealth and power within this society. Uh, I don't think anybody would have expected this um, to be the case. I imagine you're not shocked uh, at understanding that this is not how society operated back then. And so you can see that the most powerful represented the smallest part of the English population. And just like with the nobility, the gentry, was, was, uh, the gentry were responsible for the maintenance of law and order across the realm, and were also responsible for the majority of taxes. So again, the, uh, the gentry were also tasked with the uh, ability to be able to maintain law and order, to enforce law and order, and to enforce justice across the realm on the king's behalf. And so in that regard, the gentry and the nobility um, weren't too dissimilar in terms of their roles. Um, they were incredibly dissimilar in terms of the um, relative uh, rarity uh, between them. So the nobility were incredibly um, top 0.1% of the population and the gentry were much more in number. Uh, but in terms of the roles that they had within society, the ability to maintain law and order, and in terms of the, the, the relative wealth and power they had in society, they were both incredibly wealthy classes. And then uh, to finish off on the gentry, the, um, they and the nobility uh, did have some representation through Parliament as well. So they had political representation too. But after 1495, Parliament was really called. So... On the one hand, they did have representation through Parliament, which was a significant political advantage of being a member of the nobility or the gentry. But considering the fact that Parliament was uh, at the will uh, of the king at this time, uh, it's important to note that Henry would call Parliament whenever he wanted. And after the second half of his reign, as we already know, uh, he very rarely did call Parliament. And so we see that the majority of his parliaments, and therefore the majority of political power from these social classes, could only really be wielded in the first half, the first ten years or so of his reign. Within English society, we have to make reference to the church and to religion. And... Uh, under Tudor society, at least under the reign of Henry the Seventh, uh, we have the Roman Catholic Church dominating um, a lot of the day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day practice within English society. Now, obviously, we know that um, following the reign of Henry the Eighth, we see a break from uh, we see a break from Rome and a break with the Church of Eng uh, sorry not Church, with the uh, Catholic Church and the establishment of the Church of England. But at least under Henry the Seventh. Religion was significantly dominated by the fact that we have a Roman Catholic Church within English society. And it was a large and powerful organisation. There were some 10,000 clergy and around 35,000 secular clergy. And the Catholic Church in England, just like elsewhere, established its own law and court system, which would sometimes, in some cases, even challenge the authority of the king. Uh, and the reason why we have our own established judicial system within the Catholic Church during this period is to try and to deal with um, a number of different what we would describe as religious crimes. So crimes such as adultery and heresy, crimes that aren't actually crimes, but um, according to the church, uh, the Catholic Church were crimes. And so we this, this is uh, what the uh, the church law and the church judiciary uh, was stood for and existed to do. And while making up a large part of society, it's important to note that there was a lot of social division between the different levels of the clergy. So this is where it gets a little bit more mixed up. We can't really um, talk about the hierarchical ladder of English society and talk about the nobility, then the gentry, then the church, and then commoners. Because within the church system itself, there was actually a lot of social division there. There was a lot of... Um, there was 
ultimately uh, a lot of people within the church system that were that were higher up on the social hierarchy that really did have quite a lot of um, social power but you also had a people in the church that were very very low on the social hierarchy so for example um, senior clergy such as bishops and abbots uh, had much higher wealth and social status than that of the lower clergy like the parish priests so we can see that even within this a particular area within society the religious aspect and the church system that existed we can see that there is a, a significant amount of division between the higher wealth um, from um, uh, people such as bishops and abbots and then the uh, quite lower wealth and lower prestige and lower power of um, uh, uh, of people like parish priests and this does tie nicely into the next section which is that of commoners now commoners in england were by far the largest social class so these were the significant uh, this was effectively the significant um majority of 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 people who lived in english society so around two million people lived uh, as commoners in england uh, in england around the time of 1500 so we can see that the most significant, the most powerful, being the gentry and the nobility, and even some um, quite upper members of uh, the church system, uh, represented the smallest percentage of English society, with the vast, vast, vast majority of people being commoners. Of these commoners, around half had lived below the poverty line, and these were known as the labouring poor. So we have a situation here where we have, uh, of the commoners, around one million of them being below the poverty line, uh, uh, the poverty line as described um, um, today, effectively. Um, they worked for the most part in rural England, uh, doing a lot of agricultural work. This obviously included things like farming and before the 1500s began and during the first half of Henry VII's reign, social mobility was a very, very rare occurrence. And it was only becoming more common in the later years of the Tudors and moving into the Stuart period. So I've already mentioned this before early on um, at the start of this lesson, but the idea of social mobility, the idea of people within social classes moving from different class structures, people going up or people going down, uh, was very, very rare. It happened very, very rarely. It means that whatever the structure of society existed, it effectively stayed the same throughout the majority of Henry's reign and throughout the majority of the Tudor period, in fact. And it was only towards the end of the Tudor period and into the reigns of James and Charles I that we start to see a little bit more social mobility uh, taking place. So... Now that we've looked at the different structures of society and the different members within English society, let's talk about the regional divisions that existed. The maintenance of society and, and law, of, law and order within society within England was done at a regional level. And we have distinct areas of governance. And we can have, there are some examples of the different areas of governance. Um, for example, the northern part of England was governed by the Council of the North, which was located in York, as you could probably imagine. And we also have other areas um, and other distinct districts uh, or, or regional aspects of, of governance. So, for example, Wales and the West Country were governed through the Council of Wales and the Marshes. And there was also governance outside the realm of England in Ireland and Calais. So we also have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, overseas territory, if you will, in terms of um, a little bit of territory uh, in Eng uh, from sorry, from English territory in Ireland and a little bit on the mainland in Calais and we only lose Calais when um, Mary the first loses Calais later on during the Tudor period. One of the issues with this system of regional governance though was that it ultimately did limit the power of the king in some regions. So while it was the king that administered um, justice on behalf of the realm uh, to these regional levels and we still and we have like the council of the north and we have the council of wales and the marshes um, these individual regional councils uh, would effectively uh, be able to challenge the king in terms of um, the, the the kind of decisions made at this very 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 regional level now this isn't to say in any way that um, Henry the seventh was in any way challenged by these regional uh, district uh, governances uh, but just in the sense that um, 
the power of the king in some of these regions uh, was uh, severely limited by the fact that he devolved this power to these regional institutions. So, for example, there was a limitation of power over the governance of Wales and the West Country. And we see that this is done so because of the uh, relative significant power of the Council of Wales and the Marshals. Again, this wasn't a significant threat to Henry's reign in any way. We're not going to see the Council of Wales or the Council of the North actually rising up and challenging Henry to the throne. But we just see that the maintenance of law and order was something that was ultimately done more by these councils in some regions than it was by the king. And it does bring us to the, the two areas of social discontent that we can talk about during Henry's reign. And it's two rebellions in particular. We have the Yorkshire Rebellion of 1489, and then we also have the Cornish Rebellion in 1497, I believe. So the Yorkshire Rebellion, just like the Cornish Rebellion of 1497, were both rebellions that stemmed from issues relating to money. So the reason why I didn't include this uh, section on rebellion during the first lesson that we did when we talked about the consolidation of power uh, is because the rebellions against Henry's reign uh, from Perkin Warbeck or from Lambert Simnel were dynastic in nature. It, what I mean by this is they were challenges directly to the dynasty of Henry the Seventh. They they, well, they believed he had usurped uh, Richard the Third, and they believed that he was not the rightful heir, and therefore decided to rebel. These rebellions, however, were not necessarily about um, anything to do with Henry as a king in terms of uh, for any kind of dynastic reasons. They were reasons relating from his decision to raise money because Henry had attempted to raise revenue a number of times and these reasons um, the, the reasons why we see the rebellions is because of this attempt by Henry to raise revenue. So there's also the fact that these rebellions took place in these specific regions because these regions were much poorer than other regions in England, specifically places like the southeast of England. And that's one of the reasons why we see rebellions in Yorkshire and Cornwall. Uh, the people in Yorkshire resented the idea of being taxed by southerners. And on top of this, we still have a little bit of social discontent in the Yorkshire region following the death of Richard III. So people in Yorkshire weren't ever particularly fond of Henry the Seventh, and the fact that Henry the Seventh was trying to tax for uh, overseas conflicts uh, was one of the reasons why there was a little bit more social content in the northern areas. This Yorkshire rebellion specifically was centred around the raising of revenue uh, to fund the war between Brittany and France, uh, in Brittany, sorry, and France. So we know this from our foreign policy lesson, they're talking about um, the fact that Charles VIII of France uh, began to encroach increasingly on uh, the sovereignty of Brittany, and Henry agreed to send an army over that Brittany would pay for, but then that army ended up being stranded when, the, um, when Anne of Brittany married Charles VIII. So we see, we've seen this already. We know what happens in this kind of uh, issue because if you want to know more, there's, we've done a lesson on foreign policy already. And in terms of this rebellion specifically, we actually know very little details of the rebellion. One of the main things we know uh, and one of the most significant things that happened during this rebellion was the murder of the Earl of Northumberland in Yorkshire. This was in April of 1489. But other than that, there was very little that we, that we know about this rebellion. The rebellion that we know a lot more about, though, is the Cornish Rebellion of 1497. Again, it was sparked by the demand for extraordinary revenue. It was sparked by and for monetary reasons. And in this example, the rebellion was sparked specifically for the raising of revenue for a campaign against Scotland. So we can see, again, foreign policy decisions having a negative impact on English society and the, the way in which uh, Henry was administrating, uh, administrating sorry, law and order across the realm. And the reason why we know a lot more about the Cornish Rebellion than we do about the Yorkshire Rebellion is because it posed a much more significant threat to Henry than that of the Yorkshire Rebellion. And there was a few reasons for why it posed more of a threat. It was much larger rebellion for a start. Around 15,000 people were involved in it. Um, the second reason was um, that the Perkin Warbeck had attempted to utilise the rebellion for his own ends. So even though, for the most part, you know, the mass majority of the people who were rebelling in 1497 weren't rebelling for dynastic reasons, 
they were rebelling against the demand for extraordinary revenue, Perkin Warbeck came along and tried to make this uh, uh, an attempt to overtake the throne and to um, take the throne from Henry by him. And so therefore, that's one of the reasons why we see a little bit more of this being a more significant threat specifically to Henry than just to um, than just the Yorkshire Rebellion, for example. And the final reason was um, they got very, very far. They actually got as far as marching on London. And so we see that, that they got very close to London. They, they ultimately were halted just outside London. But the fact that they got this close to London shows how significant this threat was to Henry. And it was even more um, damaging to Henry because oh, on the one hand it was a significant threat to his regime but it also was made worse by the fact that Henry had to withdraw um, the campaign in Scotland or at least the campaigning against Scotland in order to ensure the security of London because we know that this rebellion was sparked by the demand for extraordinary revenue for a campaign against Scotland. So we can't simultaneously campaign against Scotland and send all of his forces up there and then also try and defend London against this rebellion of 15,000 people. So this was another reason why this was a significant rebellion. And actually, now we have finished talking about Henry the Seventh. we're going to move on to talk about, in the next lesson, Henry the Eighth. cover all the aspects uh, that will be covered in the exam on Henry the Eighth, and then we'll move on to the second half of the A-level, which is the um, mid-Tudor crisis and the reign of Elizabeth.